Today, right now, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Genesis 25. We're going to embark as best as we can with the time allowed in to go over something that I think you and I struggle with just as Jacob did. As I said in Sabbath school, Genesis is always in the context of a family. We need this more today than ever before. Families are being torn asunder in so many different ways. And other groups are the same. Whether it's churches, whether it's nations, whether it all it is, it just kind of sounds like the nations rage and they just can't stop. Well, we've talked about what caused those kinds of things to happen. But I want to get on a personal level. I want you to look at a man who probably was the head of the most dysfunctional family I've ever read about. It is absolutely unbelievable the stuff that he has there. And I'm going, why? Why did God say, let's put it in a story form? Let's put it in this form so that people can see it. And I hope that we are able to identify, you know, what it would be like for us to live in this family. Because when we start putting ourselves there, is when we start learning who we actually are. It's very easy to sit there and see it in somebody else, but not see it in ourselves. And we've talked about that this morning. It's guilt, it's shame, it's all the things that there. I, I don't want to be found out to who I really am in my own little mind and by myself. And to have that out is just like, it's embarrassing to say the least. And I want to tell you how God deals with the most dysfunctional family you've ever seen. And when you see that, I think you're going to start realizing that we want him to come faster than we feel like he is. And we want that because he is the one that will draw us all to him. And in him, we will be one. That's heaven, people. That's one. That means everybody's on the same page doing the same thing for their own choice. We want this more than anything else in the world. So how does this look like? We're starting in Genesis 25. And if you look at verse 19, I'm going to go rather quickly, but I want to show you where it is. In my class... If you don't have a Bible, then you're not prepared. <laughs> you just aren't. And if you're not opening and following, then you're not getting the lesson. Most of all, you don't know where to look when you need it personally. Um, the story starts out with the generations of, Israel, of Isaac. And you've got to realize that there's something very, very interesting about this family. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. This is God's answer, and we're going to see that this afternoon. This is God's answer to the problems that are created in Genesis 1 through 11, or Genesis 3 through 11. It is, uh, when I show you the chart, I think you'll understand it. But right now, I want you to recognize that God is trying to solve a problem, and this is the way he does it. Now, we don't have time to get into the history of Isaac and Rebecca, all that stuff, other than the fact, does anybody know who's related to Rebecca? Does anybody know? What's the family? Does anybody know her brother? Her brother is? It's Laban. I want you to think about that. This, this guy is going to cause an incredible amount of trouble in this family. Okay? And we need to catch that. So anyway, Rebecca comes and all that kind of situation. And then they have two children. Sounds familiar because Abraham had how many sons? Abraham had two sons. And one of them was accepted and the other one was rejected. Surprise, surprise. Guess what happens? Like father, like son. And how is it that they end up there? And if you look at verse 23, it says, The Lord, that's Hashim, by the way, 
Okay? The personal God. And the, no. He is God. And he's revealing himself as a person. Okay? And it says, and by the way, it says, the children were struggling together with her. This thing started long before they were born. <laughs> For whatever reason. And she says, well, why is this happening? And she inquires it of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, you have two nations in your womb. And two manners of people shall be separated from the bowels. And the one people will be stronger and the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. Now, I want you to notice that last phrase. Because why is it that Rebecca is going to deceive her husband to get Jacob to get the blessing? I want you to think about this for just a second. This is more complicated than we would like to think. Because, it, you know, you, you sit there and it's easy to judge people, but the bottom line is we've got to watch that. Okay, so in other words, we know about Isaac, I mean, uh, Esau and Jacob and all of those kind of stuff. By the way, when it says that... Um, Jacob was, this is verse 27, Jacob was a plain man dwelling in the tents. This is not a mommy's boy. This is not a mommy's boy. And I'll tell you the reason why. He struggled all night with an angel. Okay? That does not mean it that. He just simply said, I look after the family. I take care of the family. I do those kinds of things. So we need to watch it. Now Esau is the one that goes out, you know, whatever. Uh, he's already got two wives from the neighboring tribes, which he's not supposed to, okay? But what happens is, is that it gets to the place, and then now we jump over to 27. And in 27, Isaac wants to give the birthright to Esau. And you can read that, and I suggest that you look at it. Why is it that he likes this? He tells him to go out and... and uh, Get venison. He says, such as I love and bring it to me that my soul may bless thee before I die. Rebecca hears it and says, I've got to get into this because I know from God that the younger is to be served by the older. Okay, so this is not as easy to, to, to point fingers or stuff like that. So she turns to her son, Jacob, and starts going through that. And you know the situation. It's almost like Isaac kind of knew what was happening here. And yet he didn't. And it's, it's just, it's really amazing. And the reason why is because anybody touched a goat? Anybody touched a sheep? Either way. Okay, if you put that on your arms, could you tell the difference between that sheep's hair and a, a person's hair? I mean, either this guy just has no sensibilities at all and he's just kind of being a vegetable or something like that. Or something's not right. You know, I mean, you just, it just doesn't fit. Whether it's a goat or whether it's a sheep, doesn't make any difference. It doesn't feel like the hair on somebody's arm. He can't hear it, but he says, well, but it's the voice of Jacob. How does he not get this? And we're, we're not told. All we know is he didn't. So let's just leave that part. But because of what that does, Jacob has to leave. And the thing that I want us to get to, I get this out of my pocket and we'll start going out. Okay, this, by the way, um, I, I want to say to you, anybody that wants the outline of what's been on the slides, that will be available, okay? And you can use that, that's fine, because I wanted you to do that. Those of you, as I said earlier, uh, I know about PowerPoints and you're not supposed to do it the way that I did it, but I did it so that you would have a more complete overview of what I was been saying and it might be easier to study and whatever. So that's what I did it for, not because I don't know how to do a little PowerPoint slides. For those of you that are business people and there are certain rules and I know those are rules, okay? All right, so here's the thing. The big question. The headship of the clan, the authority to make decisions for the family, 
expected to be the protector of family members, guide to in relations with other clans, a double share of the inheritance to be used for the needs of the clan and to be used to meet any emergency or predicament and family member might find themselves in. That is what the birthright was and that was the reason for the double portion. That doesn't mean he gets to go out there and spend that money the way he wants to. That money is for other members of the family. I want to make that really clear because if that is the case, then Rebecca says, hey, Esau's a nice guy. He's my son. He really into doing this and this and this, but he's not into family. He's into what he likes to do, which is hunting and hanging out with the guys and all that other kind of stuff. And by the way, that's not bad. Okay. I want to make sure that that's, that's not what's being said here. Okay. But the point is, is that this is somebody, I mean, if, if Jacob takes this over, then he sits there and he says, okay, I will look out for the family. I will take care. And that's what he's doing. So you would think that Rebecca's doing, well, not really the right thing, but her heart's in the right place. She, she realizes that Jacob's got something to do with that. I don't know. I would assume that Jacob there, but if you look at how he tries to get the birthright on his own, you think this guy's, you know, you, you know what Jacob means. It means a heel grabber. Okay. In other words, he's deceptive. Which is very, very interesting because Abraham had problems with deceiving. Twice he lies about his wife. Why? Well, because God gave him the, the, the message that through him all nations would be blessed and they would be a father of many nations. Well, to do that, he's got to have a son. Well, he sent Ishmael away because that's not working, all of that stuff. So it's only Isaac, okay? So when you start seeing some of these things happen, we start recognizing that, that these people's lives is just as complicated as yours and mine. And if that's the case, then how does God deal with people that are in really tight situations in terms of family and th things like that? So we, we get into the story. We recognize that, that what has happened here is that Jacob has to leave. Now, I want you to think very clearly what he's going to have to do. Okay, this tells you a little bit about who Esau is. And I'm just going to go over that because I really like to jump down a little bit farther. Again, I would encourage you to, to get the, the outline here so that you can read it. But anyway, so, um, and I'm going to jump a little bit because I really want to get to six. This is Jacob. Yes, okay. Jacob is forced to leave for Haran. Now, you need to realize Haran is 550 miles north of where they're living. Anybody walk that far? Okay, that's what they did. That's this thing. Now you need to realize this is not just, oh yeah, that's nice fields over there and all that. No, 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 no. You're going through enemy territory. You've got the Sumerians, you've got the Hittites, you've got the Assyrians, you've got all of these kinds of people that are not too terribly friendly. And you're going by himself. Now, when Abraham's servant went to go find a wife, which was uh, Rebekah for Isaac, he told him, he says, do not, do not, you know, uh, take a wife from the Canaanites. Take it only from the family. In other words, from somebody that has a general idea of the God in heaven that we know. Okay? I told you already that Esau has already married two wives from the Canaanites. So in, all, in essence, he's really done, he's kind of cut himself off. Okay? But the thing that I want you to understand is, is that Jacob is, is, is in a really terrible disposition, the situation here is this. A, he's leaving home. B, he has deceived his father and he realizes that, and he feels bad about that. He will never see his mother again. And his brother wants to kill him. But on top of that, he has no bride price to do anything to get a wife. So he's going to get whatever he gets. Or he's going to have to find some way to make this thing work. How do you feel if you were in his situation and you know that you forced yourself, you, you caused, in essence, what has happened to you, you have to leave home? Do you think he feels guilt? Do you think he feels like a strange? I would say a lot. 
Does God know what's happened here? Oh, sure. But what is he going to do about it? That's the point. That's what I want to show you. This is the, the neatest thing that I have ever seen. And I want to get... This is, gives you a little idea of how far he has to go. He is going on a basic... Uh, it's called the Via Maris. And it is a highway, if you please, that literally goes from Babylon on one side all the way around what's known as the Fertile Crescent, which is really strange because it's actually desert. But I don't know why they do that. But anyway, that's what it is. It comes all the way around the other end. Okay, and that was the link between Egypt and Babylon. So all the trade went up and around, comes down and goes to Egypt, and then it goes all the way up and down. So now, why do you think God might have thought Israel is a good place to be? If you're going to be a missionary, where do you want to be? You want to be where everybody's going to come through. Jesus, his hometown was named as huh? Nazareth. Okay. But guess what? The, his known as his city. Does anybody know what that one was? Capernaum. You know why? Because it's on that road. So whatever ministry he does in Capernaum, there's a chance that people that are traveling from one end of the world to the other end of the world is going to hear what this guy's teaching. You know, we don't think about some of this kind of stuff. And, and when, for those of you that like geography, Bible geography is really great. Okay? So those kinds of things. Okay, so what I want us to understand is, is that he's in this kind of a mindset. He's alone. He has no money. He's, he's feeling guilty for the way that he's treated his father. He's never, he doesn't know he's not going to see his mother anymore. And his brother wants to kill him. So what does God see? How does he go about this? Turn, if you would, please, to Genesis 28. And starting with verse 12, follow along with me. And as you can see, probably you might be able to see it. Does anybody see that there are some uh, words that are uh, the same? It's one, one word used four times. Behold. I want to tell you about behold. Behold is like surprise. Or it's kind of like, you know, and some of the words we don't want to place there, but sometimes it's used that way. It's a very emotional word that sits there and says, whoa, wow. You know, that kind of stuff. It's that kind of a response, either negative or positive. How dare you, or you know, that kind of stuff. Okay? There's four beholds. Okay? So he lays down, and he's, you know, just thinking a little about it. And all of a sudden, he dreams a dream. And the first behold. The first behold is, there's a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. What is that dream telling him? How would you interpret that dream? So what is connected here? The earth and heaven. Okay? And what is Jacob feeling? Disconnected. Okay? You see what's happening here? Okay. So the first thing is, surprise! Guess what? God knows where I am. Oh, the God of my Father knows where I am. Surprise! There are angels of God ascending and descending on it. The word for angels is messenger. What is, God, what is Jacob thinking now? God sending reinforcements. Wow, I'm not alone. God knows where I am. God's sending messengers to encourage. Surprise. <laughs> Number three. The Lord stood above it and he said, now when it puts words in God's mouth, you need to understand what the message is. Okay? I am the Lord your God. Lord God is Yahweh Elohim. It's both. I'm the all-powerful and I'm personal. 
That's how they communicated. And I'm getting that straight from the, from the rabbis. And he says, I am, the, uh, watch what he does here. Watch how God introduces himself. I am the God of Abraham, your father. Well, actually grandfather. But what does that communicate to, to jo, uh, Jacob? Everything I did for Abraham, remember? Remember? I was, I was the one that did this and this and this. Remember? You've heard the stories around the fire. You know what's going on here. I am your father. So he identifies. He says, I am the father of, of God, of Abraham, the father. And then he says, I'm the God of Isaac. So in other words, these two men have told him enough about what's been going on in the family. And then he says, the land that, where you liest to thee, I will give to you and to your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and the south. And in thee and, all, and thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Do you know what he, God just told him? I'm going to give you the birthright. In other words, all of the stuff that you messed up that you think is you turned me off, I'm still going to give it to you. Why? Why would God do that? He's proven himself to be a deceiver. You know, he's done all of these kind of stuff. Why would he give him what he... That's all he ever wanted. But he tried to get it on his own power, in his own way. God doesn't need our help. We don't want that. We don't want to do it that way because if we think it that way, then we're going to think I got it instead of God gave it. And if God gives it to me, then it's on Him to help me get through it. If I take it by myself, then it's on me. You see where the problem with self comes in here? It's it just stands us right in the face. So what happens here is, is that number three, He says, everything that you wanted, I'll give, I'm giving it to you. That's the part. He says, I want that. I don't need the extra money. The point being is, is that I want the birth rate. I want that. And that's what he, and God tells me, he says, that's what it is. It's the same phraseology that he said to Abraham more than once. And he said to Isaac as well. Now, is that the way you deal with a disobedient person, a disobedient son? Do you give him what you, he wants? All oh, that's it. And you go, this is interesting. And the last one, the last one has got to be the best of them all. He says, behold, I am with you and I will keep you where? Everywhere. What does that say to Jacob? (laughs) Don't be afraid. I don't care wherever you go. I'm going to be there with you. Oh, this is good. This is good. And then it says, whether thou goest, And I'm going to bring you back here. Because see, it's very easy for Jacob to think, wow, I'm lost. I'll just go off and just kind of die quietly and whatever. No. He says, no, I'm going to bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done everything I promised you. Do you realize God says that to every single one of us? If we don't get that part, then all the other stuff that we talk about what we should or we shouldn't be doing isn't going to make a whole lot of sense. God sits there and he says, so if you've got somebody beside you saying, okay, think about that. Do you really want, oh yeah, you're right. You're probably, we need those kind of people in our lives, do we not? And when it's God, that's the best. And that's what God's promising Jacob. Does he deserve it? No. Is he going to get it? God's there. He says, I'm I'm here. Do you realize now what Jacob says in verse 16? Surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know. Uh Uh-oh. Does that kind of tell us what happens to us too? God was in this place and I didn't know it. How many times do we act as if we're alone? And then we regret what we do and then just say, wait a minute, you mean you were here and I did Boy, that was really dumb of me to do. You know? I mean, come on. I mean, this is where we talk about God being agape, love. That is a totally different concept and maybe we'll have some time to talk about that too. But the, I want you to see what God's love looks like. He doesn't walk away from the rebellious. He tries to save them. 
Wow, that's kind of a new concept for some of us. So he sits there and he says, I'm going to surely give, um, and of all, and then uh, yeah, Jacob makes a vow. Now watch carefully what he says and what he doesn't say. Again, conversations, interactions like this will tell you a lot about the participants in the relationship. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I can come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Does that tell, is Jacob arrived faith-wise? He starts out if. You can take that both ways. And I want to say both ways because, you know, if sounds like doubt. On the other hand, it says, hey, if God's promising this, then I'm on. See, I mean, it could be commitment or it could be that. And I say that because sometimes we do both those things at different times in our lives. The if is doubt. And the other say, hey, you know, if this is what God, I'm going to take his promise and I'm going to work, I'm going to run with this. Okay? So that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give a tenth of thee. That's the first mention of tithing. Why is he giving it? Why should we give tithe? Because we agree or disagree with who might spend it? Or are we giving it to the Lord saying, hey, this is yours. This is about you and me. This is not about anybody else. We're giving tithe to the Lord. All right, so he starts off to the land of the east. Now, what's really interesting here is, and we went through that, so let's talk about the later life. And the later life, there is struggles. Laban's multiple changes for Jacob's work. How many of you would have liked, or maybe you all already do, have you ever worked for somebody like Laban? Anybody? Ever, ever work with this guy? Okay, this guy is shifty. He sits there and he keeps changing. He says, oh, well, let's do this and this and this, you know, and he, he keeps changing. Do you realize how many times he changed his, his salary? It's crazy how many times. I'll let you find that for yourself. Okay, so in other words, he knows, now that, watch what's happened here. What is Jacob's name of his meaning? The meaning of his name is the deceiver, the heel grabber. Okay? Now, we could go a little bit farther, but I won't. Um, just real quick, the head always has at the beginning, and the heel is at the end, and you get the birthright at the end of your father's life. So he's trying to grab that kind of situation. So that's there too. All right, so here's the thing. You've got Laban to meet up with. He sits there and he says, I want Rachel. Does Laban say no? Does he agree? Okay. See what's happening here? And after seven years. Now, here's the thing. When we start talking about how Leah ends up as wife instead of Rachel, you need to understand certain things. You don't necessarily see in an older wedding, Jewish wedding, that you actually see the face of the girl. They usually wear something over their face, something like that. So you really don't see that. So there's that possibility. But then you've got to understand is that once they go into the tent, you would think that somebody would know something. And for whatever reason, didn't. And there's, some, there's a lot of stuff, and I don't want to get into it all. But I do want you to understand is, is that when he woke up the next morning, and he's going, it's Leah? How dare you? How dare you? Do you realize the betrayal that he feels? Okay, he, it was said, it was all that kind of stuff. And all Laban says, well, that's not our custom. And what can Jacob do about this? Nothing. He can't. He's stuck. Okay, is it his fault? No, but I'll tell you what, he knows exactly how his brother feels. Right or wrong, okay, understand. But he understands deception. Now, again, 
Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob, all three of the uh, patriarchs, have used deception to try to do God's will. Abraham goes down to Egypt, and he sits there and he says, this is my sister. Is he telling a lie? Well, no, they happen to be half-brother and half-sister. But that's not what it is. He didn't tell the truth. He does it the second time with Abimelech. And he sits there and he calls him and says, hey, wait a minute here. This is your wife. You didn't tell me that part. Okay, so you're half-sisters, but they would do that. You, you know, you're doing it. Isaac does the same thing. Now Jacob deceives his father. And now he feels like, oh, that's what it feels like to be deceived. Did God necessarily plan that? I don't think so. And yet at the same thing, he allowed it. And you go, well, why, Lord? Why did you do it? Why did you have to do it? I don't know. But I'll tell you what I see. And what I see is, is that when you see what you have done to somebody else, when it happens to you, you become a different person the way that you look at the person that you wronged. And you say, do I ever want to do this again? No. Sometimes God allows us to experience what we've done to other people so that we know and learn. I'll never do that one again. I, I see what that is. We, I don't know. It never ha- happened to you? There are times when I see that in myself. And I'm going, boy, I didn't realize that that's what I did. That idea is going to come back, people. That's going to come back. Okay, so what happens here is, is that he now has two wives. Do you know that there is actually a, a, a test, a, a text in Leviticus that says a man should not marry two wives, uh, two sisters? I think that's good counsel. Okay. <laughs> okay. Even polygamy. Just, just, just don't even think twice, man. Guys, this does not work. Jacob makes this loud and clear. Okay? And the problem is, is that he didn't cause it. He didn't actually set this thing up this way. It's his father-in-law that did this. And it gets very, very frustrating. But he learned something. And that's going to, to bring about some things. Now, take a look. You've got four sons that come directly from Leah right away. Just one, like one year after the next, it seems like. Just boom, 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 boom. Okay? Rachel has none. That's going to get really interesting. Because they feel like, you know, and this is what's going to happen later on with uh, another story. And that's Judah and Tamar. Don't have time to get into that today. We'll do it a little bit later this afternoon. But what I want you to understand is, is that here's the basic principle. You're going to see recurrence of the same kinds of conflicts within these people's lives. And it, they keep repeating themselves. And we see just a little bit of a change to each story. But they're all basically about family issues. Do we have family issues? Do we have things to work with in our lives like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Okay, that's where God is teaching us how to have character that will draw the family to become one. You hear what I'm saying here? I want you to consider it, do with it whatever you want. But it seems to me as I go through this, I keep finding that God puts us in situations where it's established. You know what? I'm not, I don't want to do this ever again. I did this. I thought it was going to be a good idea, but that's wrong because it hurts somebody else. Hey, that's how families stay together. And so what's happening here is, is that he's dealing with this. He, now you've got the sons. You got to realize, hey, you know, the brothers are saying, why is our father not treating my, our mother right? And Rachel's saying, why did you marry me? Why don't I have kids? God is punishing me. You see where all of these strange ideas about God start coming up. It's all God's fault. You know, he's not doing this, you know, all that kind of stuff. Nobody's owning things. 
The next thing that you see here is that when Jacob, Jacob, I'm sorry, when Rachel finally has a son, can you imagine what that family was like? Joseph gets all of daddy's best. Now, let's just talk fairly about jo- Jacob. Jacob, he, he looks at his brother, and the brothers have not done too terribly well. A lot of things, quite frankly. You know, uh, the brothers, they just start getting this gradual idea of, you know what, it's my mom versus the other one. And it goes back, and it's just tearing the family apart. To where you've got, sis, you've got sisters who are basically saying, okay, if I can't have kids, you're going to sleep with my, my uh, attendant, and she'll be a secondary wife, and we'll get it, you know, and this is, this is what Abraham did, right? This is what it, and who, who gave, brought up the idea of Hagar? Sarah. Okay, so, you know, this, you can't sit there and point a finger at one person. It's just like we're all doing this kind of weird stuff. Trying to cover, do the right thing for the wrong, in the wrong way, which just simply causes more problems. Okay, so if you've got a family that's made up of all of this kind of confrontation and, and conflict, you sit there and you say, how in the world is this family ever going to turn into something positive? Please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And I want you to understand God's original promise to Abraham was as following. Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land which I will show you. Okay. And then watch what verse 2 says. I will make of you a great nation. How do you make a great nation? By having children, right? Okay. All right. Now, why would he do that? I will bless thee and make your name great. Name is, in essence, another word for character. I will make what you stand for great. And then he says, and you shall be a blessing. To who? Anybody who comes around. Okay? And I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you and you. And this is the one I want you to catch. In thee shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. Did Abraham do that well in Egypt? Nope. Did Abraham do any better in Philistia where Abimelech took his wife? Nope. Didn't do that. How about Isaac? Isaac did the same thing with Abimelech. He was out there with his wife and he say, wait a minute, this is the only thing you do between a wife and a husband and uh -uh, no, that's not it. How is the world going to be blessed if God's people are enmeshed in all of this stuff? Family politics. And if you and I were looking at it like an angel or something like that, we would be as humans saying, boy, I don't know how in the world you're going to put this family together. You're putting your, your faith in the wrong person here. This just is not going to work. And I almost see a smile on God's face. Well, you watch. You watch me. I can do this if they'll let me. And, and I think that that's not the smile we see very often of God. And I realize that I'm using euphemisms here to, to sit there and try to talk about God. God. God is not a human being. Don't misunderstand. But he deals with you and me and we are. And when you are in one country, then you act like they do. And the point is, is to communicate, you've got to understand the other person. And that's what God does. Oh, wait a minute here. Love one another as I have loved you. Have we, have we not heard that one? In other words, we treat people like we would want to be treated. And that means somebody understands you. Somebody understands you. Now, they might know something more than you do. Okay, that's fine. But then there's that camaraderie that really makes a family really a good thing. And God says, this is what I planned. Do you see how people on the outside could say, God, you're not going to make this happen. You just won't. 
It's just, it's impossible. And yet, he did it. And he deals with Jacob in an amazing way. Go back up here to the, to there. After how many years is he with Laban? About 20. Here's the interesting part. And that is the fact that he keeps changing his, 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 uh, uh, his wages. He's done the deception with Leah and Rachel and all that kind of situation. And the problem that we need to realize is that when he finally leaves, he says some very strong things. And I believe, and I wasn't planning on looking at this one, but let's just see if we can find it real quick. Um, it is... It is... 31? Thank you. In 31, he makes a very interesting comment. He says, Jacob is... Uh, they're, they're complaining about what he does, and finally he realizes he has to leave. Verse 3, it says, The Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of your fathers. He said that. Remember, that's a, that's a, a, a fulfillment of prophecy. God's keeping his promise there. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field. Why do you think he had to do that? Because he's got to keep it from guess who. Okay? He says, I've seen your father's countenance and it's not towards me and it's not good, but God of my father hath been with me. He recognized it. He says, okay, let's do this. Your father has deceived me, changed my wages 10 times. Sorry, I said 20, but it's 10. But God suffered him not to hurt me. He recognizes that God has been protecting him. Do you know when God's protecting you? Do you know when God's working in your life? Because he wants you to. Because that's the only way you keep up with any kind of a fellowship. And so he does all of those things. So he finally says it. Okay, so now this gets really funny. He takes off. Laban finds out that he's gone. And it's so crazy because we say the mispa. Okay? Do you remember that one? What do we, what's the mispa say? Anybody? That we, that we may... Absolutely. Okay, now here's the funny part. Under what circumstances was that said? What they do is they put, they put this monument, this rock over here, and says, I won't cross over this line if you don't cross this line. So we can't seem to get along. So I promise I won't cross that line if you don't cross that line. That doesn't sound like friendship. That's just like dealing with you know, the situation and it's not really among friends at all. It's actually against enemies. It really is. It, we tend to use it in another sense, but that's really the original intent of the mispah. Just, hey, I won't draw this. I won't go across that line. I won't bother you and you don't bother me and we'll just leave it at that. He has been the victim for the, every time he's been there at Laban's house. And then he turns the other way and now he's the abuser. He's going to face his brother. Which I find is really interesting. The story is, is that Jacob sees it from both sides. He experiences both sides being a victim and being the, the abuser, the deceiver. And that scares him to death. He's got a lot to lose there's a lot of things that God has promised him. Is he thinking about that? Is he convinced that God's going to keep his promise? He says, I will, pre I will be with you. I will protect you. I will do all those kinds of things. Or is he sitting there going, I hope he is. And he has to take time to set aside. And he goes away, sends everybody away. And he goes out at night. And all of a sudden, he's confronted. Now, I want to ask you a question that we don't usually ask when it comes to this story. That was a heavenly messenger. Jesus, angel, 
at this point in time of what I'm saying, it doesn't really make a difference. But here's the interesting part. What was his original intent when he came to see Jacob? He's a heavenly messenger. Jesus himself, it doesn't make any difference. The bottom line is, why is that person there? To fight with Jacob? I don't think so. Who started the fight? More likely, I would guess it would be Jacob because he's running scared and he thinks that somebody's out to get him, whether it's Esau or one of his men or one of Laban's men who didn't listen. I mean, all of that stuff. Bottom line is he is in the defensive mode. And when you are struggling like he was, reeling that soon he is going to meet the brother he deceit, he stole from, you tell me how he's going to act. The answer is there and he doesn't see it. How many times have we fought with the Lord and didn't realize he was there? And the only way that you would know is what did God promise? What has God said he was doing? What is his intentions? Where is he going? What's he trying to accomplish? All of those things. How have I treated people in the past? This is the reason why we look at history. History in the Bible is not about other people. This is the history of how God treats people in a totally different fashion than we think. And when you so it's not their history, it's God's history and how he treats people. And then you sit there and you say, so I guess is I think that angel was there just like for the same reason why the 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 dream that Jacob had at Bethel. I think he was there to encourage him. Now I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Because that's not the character of God. God's not there to sit there and say, you know. We've waited long enough. Now it's time for you. You know, he doesn't do that. Now what's interesting is, is this, is that when he sees Esau, you got to watch how that happens. And I'd like for us to look at it briefly here because I'm not going to have a whole lot here, but turn if you would please down to 33. And it says, it says in verse 4, that, but just before that, Jacob bows himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. <laughs> Did Jacob ever thought that that might have actually going to happen? No. We forget that when we're in struggles with other people that maybe God's working with them as hard as he's trying to work with us. We forget that, don't we? Okay? What am I trying to say? All weekend, you're going to hear from me, God isn't who we think he is. He's better than we ever thought he was. And he's been trying to help us in ways that we just seem to ignore or we don't deal with it. And when you actually read the Bible as it reads and take a little bit of time to think through, well, what would this actually be like if I was actually there? You go, whoa, wait a minute here. I'm seeing a God who's far more gracious and loving and all this other kind of stuff. Why did I think he was this and this and this? When we start seeing God as he is, then the fear starts going away. We sit there and say, okay, now, so if that's the case, if I don't have to worry about anything because you are in control and if there are things I need to experience or maybe you know go through then that's okay but God is always going to temper it the bottom line is is that God's on my side and so the bottom line whatever you do isn't to be feared I'm concerned if God gets upset at me if I did something wrong but you no nah, uh, no no because God's in the business of saying let's let's pull together here okay now what I just simply said is, does not disagree with the fact that the wicked are not going to have a good time. But that's their choice, not God's choice. How, do you, how does a parent sit there and say, well, you know what? You deserve to die. So, that's how people think God is. 
He's not. He sits there and he says, he weeps over any lost soul. But he says, I have to be honest too. And that's what gets us. We don't know how, how to sit there and balance. And here it is. Justice and compassion. See what happens with that? You, you push this, it messes up. You push this, and you're letting things go you shouldn't be letting go. And it's supposed to be like this. This is the whole story of Job, people. I'm telling you this because I want you to understand when you open up your book, the Bible, you're going to find all of these stories that deal with real problems that you and I face on a day-to-day -day basis. And the answers are there. And when you start seeing that, you go, wow, this is something I can get into. And then I learned how to treat my brother and sister. See? And that causes oneness. And if you haven't read John chapter 17, which we'll look at a little bit later this afternoon, that's the three angels' message. And all of a sudden you just go, oh man, this just changes the whole thing. It's all there. It's just we never gave God the credit for being the God of love that he claims to be. So, I would like to slow a little bit because I've kind of jumped over a few of the slides. I'd like to actually finish up with the last one. How do we make sense of the struggles God led Jacob through in his journey to become the father of the nation to represent him to the world? How do we make sense of the struggles God led Jacob through in his journey to become the father of the nation to represent him to the world? What benefit were those struggles that he had? Most of them were of Jacob's own making. Consequences of his actions. Was it painful for Jacob? At times, yes. But you look at the record. Did God put all of those things on him? Or did he earn them? <laughs> did he earn them? Did he, did he do something that, that led? Because here's the point. God has to walk a thin line here. Because he wants his children home. But he has to show the world that he is a just God. Because that's who he is. So therefore there are things that he allows. But he always tempers them. That's a key word here. Jacob did not receive what he deserved. David did not get what he deserved. I'll show you one last text here. They'll be surprised, and I'll, I'll finish with that. Turn, if you would, to the book of Kings. 2 Kings. And I always get this wrong. And maybe it's 2 Kings 14. I keep quoting and I, this is one text I simply just can't remember. Maybe it's 1 Kings. Teachers have the problems too. I so want you to understand. Oh, come on. This is really frustrating. 14... Verse 7. Yes! Okay, it is in 1 Kings chapter 14. I keep switching the numbers and it just, I, I, for whatever it is. Okay, the story is this. Jeroboam is the king of the ten tribes in northern Israel. Okay? And there is a, a prophet who is in the lower kingdom and Jeroboam's uh, was supposed to find out whether or not 
Her son, who is sick, is going to die. Starting with verse 5, And the Lord said to Ajiah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing for thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shall you say unto her, for it shall be when she comes in, she will feign herself to be another woman. Okay, so here it is. Ajiah, the, the prophet of God, knows that the wife of Jeroboam is going to come and say, Hey, you know, my son is sick. Can you please heal him? Now, you remember Jeroboam used to be a friend. Now he's not. Okay, so it came, verse 6, when Ajiah heard the sound of her feet and she came to the door, he couldn't really see all that much. And he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou self to be another? For I was sent to thee with heavy tidings. Go tell Jeroboam, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For inasmuch as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, I rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it to you, but you have not been as my servant David. And I want you to list very carefully what he says. You were not like my servant David, who kept my commandments. He did not. Who followed me with all of his heart. He did not. To do that which was only right in my eyes. He did not. How can God say this? Because David was forgiven. You read Psalms 50. And you hear a man who's contrite, who has put it before God. And you look at that and you say, how in the world can God have a straight face and say that about David? And the answer is, I can save to the uttermost people. There is no one that has any excuse not to be saved. It's our own choice to sit there and say, nope, I think I'm going to do what Eve did. I think I can do it on my own. Or I don't care. But I hope that you've seen just a window, and that's all I can ask. Go back and read the stories. It's amazing. I am. I'm writing a book, and I'm finishing up on Genesis right now, and uh, on the story of Joseph. And I am utterly amazed at the righteousness of God and how He treats sinners. And when you have a message like that to go out and tell, you get excited. You get excited because that is the best news you ever heard because it deals with the real problems that you and I face and yet at the same time, it, it, it rests our case, it rests, gives us rest in Christ that, hey, you know what? And I'll finish up with a story. I'm a San Francisco 49er fan. I grew up in Silicon Valley before it was called Silicon Valley. And my dad was a music teacher, and he taught piano and organ. And he taught one of the 49ers. His name was Leo Nomalini, and his wife wanted organ lessons, so he taught her. And every so often, he'd say, hey, how would you like to see the game? We're going to do this and this and this. So we got tickets. 50-yard line, 10 rows up. I mean, we, we, it was good. Unfortunately, the 49ers were losing a lot, so that wasn't fun. But when they started to win, I'm going, oh, this is kind of cool. This is all that kind of stuff. And for those of you gentlemen that watch, you know the story about the Super Bowl where the Cincinnati Bengals were up 13 to 10 with a minute and 32 seconds left. And on the, the Cincinnati side, who had already lost once in the Super Bowl of 49ers, were jumping up and down. Oh, wow, well, we're going to win, we're going to win. And there was one guy that wasn't doing it. And you know who he is. Chris Collinsworth. Chris Collinsworth is a commentator now, but he was a uh, whiteout for uh, there. He was the one that they go out for passes and throw all that kind of stuff. And he says, guys, uh-uh, this game isn't over yet. And he pointed and he says, because that guy's out there. And he pointed to Joe Montana. And if you've ever watched, I mean, I've watched it more than a few times because it's just fun to watch, but... This guy was on the eight-yard line. He had 92 yards, had to go almost the whole field all the way down to get a score, 13 to 10, and they were behind. And he does it. There was a 10-yard you know, penalty on the 49ers, and they, they kept going. And with 20 seconds, 20, 
Yeah, it was 20 seconds left. He throws a touchdown pass to John Smith in the end zone, and the 49ers win. Now, you would think that would be it, and everybody's cheering and all that kind of stuff, but most people did not hear what went on in San Francisco when the team returned. There were some people that were there and said, were you afraid that you weren't going to win? And the players said, no. But we were afraid. You were afraid? What do you mean? What were you afraid of? And this is what they said. We had no question about Joe Montana. We were going to win the game. That was it. My fear was I wasn't going to be where Joe needed me to win the game. People, I suggest the same to you. Are we positioning ourselves? Are we allowing God to lead us to the place where he needs us to be? To reach out to those people that he wants desperately. Where we are. Who the people that we rub shoulders with. So that they can win. And come home with all of us together. If we don't get that message, then that's sad on us. That's the way God plays the game. I have no question that God can do it. The question is, is that do I think he can do it in me and use me to help somebody else so that they enjoy what we can enjoy? And when you look at the stories that God gives us to look at, like Jacob, you say, boy, if he could save that one, boy, <laughs> then I've got a chance. And that's called hope. And hope leads to faith. And faith learns to returning the love that God has first shown us. Does that make sense? Because that's the reason why I go to church. And that's why I'm not afraid to stand up and say, you know what, I think we need to look at God again. Because I don't think we're giving him half of what he deserves. And there are a whole lot of people that need to know that because they still think he's fighting against them. Or, hey, you know, I don't want to be around him. That's the kind of God that we serve people. So I pray as we continue this afternoon. We're going to talk about judgment. Did you see the, the, the last message of what we're going to talk about? The good news about judgment? Surprise, surprise. I want you to you know, follow along with me, I hope. I hope I'm stimulating your minds to go and study for yourself. Don't sit there and quote me. Go back and find scripture. That's where it's going to be. If you don't know it there, then you don't know it. It's kind of like your teacher. Sit there and says, well, whatever. Enough said. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven.